It's like a local grandmaster, okay? So, so here's, here's the experiment. They, they, they show him a... Uh, no. Okay, so, so what I'm going to be showing you is where they show this guy who's, you know, who's, uh, he's at the, at the low grand, grandmaster level. They show him a chest position with many, many pieces on here. And you'll see, and, they, and, they'll, and they'll let him look at this for two seconds. Two seconds. So does anybody, can anybody guess what the difference between the two were? Yeah. Uh, the experimenters exchanged the colors, so wherever there was supposed to be white, they put black, and wherever there was supposed to be black, they put black. Not the quite, one, not quite. The first one was familiar to, to the first uh, The first picture was familiar for him. It was in the context. Maybe he knew it beforehand. The next one, maybe the... It was the st structure was quite different. That's why he didn't. Yeah, the second one was randomly put, and the first yes. one was yes. exactly. That's exactly right. Okay, exactly. I mean, both you can alter. The first one was in a real chest position he never saw before. Okay, I mean, being chest white, he looks at the thing, and in two seconds he, he got it. And so, in fact, in the study, they gave him one hundred uh, real chest positions with some of them varying a number of pieces. Okay. Even when the full pieces were on there, he made less than 1% errors. The second time was absolutely right, random. Can't do it. And couldn't even do it when there were like 10 pieces on there. And in fact, what was interesting is they took people who don't play chess, they did just as well as he did random. Okay? So, somebody who plays chess well, it doesn't make any sense. It has no context to it, right? But the, but the chess positions, you just look at it, I mean, I, I, I used to play with, uh, the, um, with the ambassador to, um, to um, where? Montenegro. Montenegro, my wife. Yeah, Montenegro, who is a chess champion in Montenegro. And, he, and he used to, I used to go to his uh, embassy and play, and he'd come to, to my place and play. He beat me every time. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, I was good, but not that good. And what was interesting is, you know, we played a game for an hour, and then he'd say, okay, let, let me show you. And he'd go through all the moves, from first move to last move, exactly what happened. You know, okay, I did that, you did this, I did that, and I was amazed. That's what this guy could do. You know, he sort of pieces. So, here's the point. We're teaching a lot of kids, at least in America, stuff that has no context to it. You know, memorize the different uh, nerves of the body. There's no context to it. You know, uh, here, uh, you know, the only thing, the only thing you can, you can kind of do that way is multiplication table. Two times two is four, four times four, all like that kind of stuff. But everything else you have to have a concept of. When our older daughter was in high school in uh, California, I was furious reading the book that she had on the brain. It was just a bunch of facts without any kind of, you know, context, with any, without any kind of storyline behind it. 
And I went and I told the teacher, I said, you know, if I had this book when I was in high school, I would never be where I am today because I would hate this subject because it's just a bunch of memorization. And so it's, it's a challenge for, for parents and for teachers to put things in a context that the person can readily grasp and so on. And, 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 and it makes all the difference. Did you play the last one? Oh, yeah, the last one. Play the last one. What I was trying to do was just sort of absorb the position um, and understand um, where everything was clustered and, and try to quickly understand what was going on, um, establish some logical connections between things. And occasionally, um, I've never done, I, I've, I've almost never done this sort of thing before, so I don't have a good sense of how much time different things are going to take me. Um, but the important thing is to try to make everything make sense. That's exactly the point. Try to make everything make sense. So when you take your classes here in AEU, make sure your professors make everything make sense. And don't complain to the president. Tell them, tell them that uh, the, in the lecture you heard here, everything should make sense. Otherwise, it's not a good, a good lecture. And so the last thing is uh, just a, um, a uh, cover from my uh, article I did for this journal with a colleague of mine in Australia, Dr. Andrea. And, um, uh, there was a lead article in there about how the brain develops, and they hired an artist to discover. And I really like this cover. It's been a long, a long time ago, and it's been reprinted other places. So, a guy called Eric Alex Meredith, who is a uh, neuroscientist, is also an artist, and, uh, and, I, and I like the way he did that. So, so here is you know a sketch of the brain, the two eyes, and the and the visual system. Here is uh, a uh, uh, the the, the uh, genes. And you know the idea is that uh, neuroscientists study uh, rodents, the cats, monkeys. But really, really, what we want to do is explain what goes on here, because that explains you know what we are and how we became that way. So thank you very much. studies, uh, you know, there are, by the way, an attempt to um, combine religious beliefs with science. There are, there are, there's a foundation in the United States that actually gives uh, quite a bit of money to this, uh, but I don't think that they've done something like localizing in the brain where the belief system is. Uh, I, I, I don't know of anything, and there may well be, but I don't know anything like that. Yeah. Um, two questions, if I may. Uh, sure. First one, you may have heard about Neuralink, an uh, initiative by Elon Musk. And uh, what do you think about that? Is it naive? Is it possible to link brain to computers at some point? And uh, second, a silly, really silly question. What do you think is best, audiobooks or regular reading, which is better imprinted in the brain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so there's no, uh, and this Kasparov book, which, which is all about this, what you're just talking about, all about this with computers being linked to brains in the future and, and in the context of his loss of Big Blue. I really recommend it. It just came out last month. So I think, you know, I think there's no uh, question that at some point something like that's going to happen because uh, uh, the processing of computers of information and so on is a, uh, a fact. It happens already. How it can be incorporated into functioning of neurons and so on. Right now, it's science fiction, and, and but I, you know, I would I would not say it's not going to happen because things change so quickly. Uh, really, my guess is the question is, what are the ethical implications of it? You know, there are a lot of things we can do scientifically right now that will not be allowed to do. For example, we can modify human genes right now, uh, and it's not allowed anywhere in the world. You know, to produce sort of superhuman, and so maybe maybe some somebody's going to do it. Some country's going to do it. So there are a lot of things we can do technically that is not being done, and so it has an ethical component to it. 
But from a science component of it, I think I think it's just a matter of time before something like that's going to happen. There are a lot of people working on this, and uh, it's just a matter of uh, somebody demonstrating the power of that approach. Uh, the, the, the the issue of audio books and reading that gets to the question of what the preference is. Okay, personal preference. I mean, even let's say let's say Kindle. You know what Kindle is? Kindle versus regular books. I read a lot. I mean, I, 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 uh, I at least one book a week. Uh, you know, I, I like to, I've always liked to read, but I don't particularly like Kindle. You know, I have one, but I don't use it. Just my own per preference. On the other hand, when I go on a trip with a good friend of mine, he's got Kindle, he's got all the books, and he reads it all the time. So it's so it's kind of you know what works for you. And and I think oh, I take home message from this, especially to the young people here. Very very important as you go through your studies. You don't have to be good at everything. You have to find out what, you, what you're good at, okay? And that's a very difficult thing to do. So for example, when I was a graduate student, um, we uh, uh, had to learn all kinds of things about equipment, you know, in the laboratory, electrophysiological equipment. Uh, computers were just coming in, they had to learn Fortran. I hated that stuff. I was very bad at it, okay? And I worried about that. Well, how am I gonna go into science and be, you know, and there are scientists when I don't really know how to build my own amplifier. Because we had, uh, we had uh, courses that you had to learn how to build an amplifier for electrical recording. I didn't like that at all. And it made me very worried because there are other kids, you know, my, my friends who could do it like that. You know, uh, and, but what I realized very early, and I'm so glad I did that, was that that stuff was nonsense. What you had to do to succeed in science is not to build equipment. It's to come up with an idea that was unique, that could be funded, and figure out how to take that idea from an idea to finished product in a top-notch journal. And I found out very early I could do that. I'd have a class and a professor would say, okay, let's say uh, we want to test this hypothesis. Uh, can anybody come up with an idea and we test this hypothesis? I could do it like that. And the other guys, but I couldn't build equipment. So it's very important to kind of figure out what you can do. You know, if you can come up with ideas, you get grant money, you can hire.